Thank you. Uh, I want to tell you first, I learned something very important last night from Mr. Berg. Uh, I discovered that Norway, the country in which I was brought up and born, South Africa, and my country of adoption are all very much the same in regard to their football teams. They're all lousy, and I think if they played each other, the score would be naught, 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 naught. But with that important observation, I go on to more important things. Israel's always been under boycott. Even before the state was created in 1948, in 1945 already, Arab states were saying they're boycotting Jews and Zionists. And when 1948 came and the war ended, Arab states instituted a formal boycott of Israel, which goes on to this day. And you can look at the records, and just a year or so ago, you'll find Arab spokespeople complaining that the Arab states aren't observing the boycott. Because, of course, Israel has survived despite the boycotts. And it's flourished to an inc incredible extent. El Al is at trouble. It can't ever fly Arab states, but it's managed, and it's a very successful airline. Our trade has expanded, our contact with the world has expand, expanded, but there has been the boycott, and it's important to remember that. We've always been under threat. The most recent one came because the Arab nations, they tried war, one war after the other. They didn't succeed. They tried hijackings. You remember going back to the 60s and 70s, the first hijackings, Leela Khalid? The misery we all experience when we go through airports now began then. <laughs> and it just got worse over the years. But the first hijacking was Palestinian to draw attention to themselves. So they tried hijackings, they tried wars, they tried the violence of the intifadas, and that had a catastrophic effect in Israel. Because the second intifada in particular, with the suicide bombings, drove most Israelis to the right where there was a strong peace movement, it disappeared. And I keep telling Basim and other Palestinian friends, you guys were crazy. You drove people the other way. You destroyed whatever hopes of peace we had. When I went on Aliyah in 1997, it was to start a dialogue center in Jerusalem because there was all the hope of going forward after the Oslo Accords, which a lot of people are critical about. I'm not. Oslo was a turning point. It could have been a turning point. It's failed, but that's for other reasons. But we had our hopes then, and they were destroyed by violence. Finally came 2001, the anti-racism conference in Durban. And I was there. I was invited by the Israeli government to join the government delegation, and I didn't want to. I said, I'm a journalist. I don't represent governments. But because of my knowledge of apartheid, I was persuaded to join the delegation and I went to Durban and I'm glad I did. Because as you might remember, there was a government conference, all the governments of the world, preceded by a conference of NGOs and that was a hate fest. That was pure hatred for Israel. Now the word for it. And they adopted a set of resolutions condemning Israel above all other sinners in the world, alleged or real and called for boycotts. That's where it really began. The resolution went so far that for the only time in UN history, the, government, the conference of governments refused to accept the resolution, turned away from it. Instead, what happened then, they'd already gone far beyond anyone could, what rational people could accept. A few days later, 9-11 happened in New York, and that whole boycott issue and the hatred for Israel went on to the back burner for a few years. Palestinians picked it up in 2005 and launched BDS. And that's the current tactic. I'm telling you this, it's part of the progress, the line over the years. It's a safe way to do things. You can sit in Ramallah, as Basim was saying, and call for boycotts and not observe them yourself and other people in the world will do the work for you, safely also. There are no jail punishments, there are no penalties to be paid, you can do it. Now, Integral 
to the boycott call of BDS and others is the fact that it's based on South African apartheid. And this is very deliberate because South Africa was the pole cat of the world. It was shunned by the world because of apartheid. The Afrikaans word, which means apartness, segregation, in an institutionalized, formal way by government. If Israel can be made, declared apartheid, like South Africa, it can be treated in the same way, subject to international isolation, boycotts, driven into the cold. That is the basic purpose of BDS. That is why there is the link with apartheid. It's very deliberate, very careful. And South Africa is the place where it all comes from. And a lot of the venom against Israel comes from South Africa. And that's an issue I can deal with later if anyone's interested. Ultimately, it means the destruction of Israel. That's what BDS is. And I'll come back and describe that in more detail later on. But that is the, the ultimate aim. There's no question about it. Now, this is the first big lie. The apartheid analogy. It's a lie which is built on ignorance, distortion, deliberate deception, total infamy. There is no basis to it in fact. And let me now explain. I said a bit about myself earlier. I've been a journalist virtually all my working life. I don't represent anybody. I'm not a propagandist. I don't represent the Israeli government. I don't belong to any organizations. The only organization I belong to is I'm on the editorial board of the Palestine Israel Journal, which is a quarterly which appears in Jerusalem and is run jointly by Israelis and Palestinians and is a unique organization. But otherwise, I'm beholden to no one. And I describe things as I see them. I hope you will agree and respond to what I say. No doubt you're going to disagree with me. I hope you won't throw stones at me, as some might do, but we'll sit and we'll argue about it if necessary. But I want to make quite clear where I am, because I will be saying things which I think some people will not be happy about. But that is my role to describe a situation. Now, what is this apartheid? South Africa had its first European settlers in 1652 from Holland. And there was discrimination and oppression of the indigenous black people from the start. The British came at the beginning of the 19th century and they continued it. The Afrikaner nationalists, who during the Second World War were Nazi sympathizers, took over in 1948 on the slogan of apartheid, segregation. They were elected by minority, by the way, but they were elected, and they began to drive their racial discrimination and white domination into every nook and cranny of society. So we landed up with a country where hundreds of laws, laws determined where you were born, all depended on your color. 16% were whites, about three quarters of a million were Asians from Indians who'd come to work in South Africa in the late 19th century and early 20th century, and the rest were mixed race coloreds. Blacks formed about 75% of the population. So it was a totem pole. Whites at the top, Asians and coloreds, the mass of blacks at the bottom. And whites got the best of everything. All the laws were structured to ensure that whites got the ultimate privileges. Where you were born, where you would grow up, in which area, which school you could go to, which determined the quality of your life. Because the schools for blacks were debased, starved of resources, deliberately, deliberate education for inferiority. That was deliberate. And the damage is still being felt today, years la later. Where you could work, which university you could go to, if you could go to university, which park bench you could sit on, which beach you could use, which cinema you could go to, if there was a cinema in your area. Anyway, in the black areas, there weren't mainly which bus you could ride, which train you could ride, whom you could marry, whom you could have sex with. From beginning to end, it was determined, and ultimately, where you were going to be buried. From birth to death, it was all predetermined by the color of your skin. That was apartheid. 
That's what apartheid meant. Now, people say to me, some people, Israel is apartheid. And I say, well, what are you talking about? Well, it looks like apartheid, or it's reminiscent of apartheid, or it seems to be apartheid. And some of them say, it's worse than apartheid. And I look at them and say, you, you, you know what you're talking about. You've either forgotten what apartheid was, or you're totally ignorant about it, or you're being misled. You're just incredulous and in believing what people are telling you, or you know nothing about Israel. And your example is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He was a very old friend of mine, very fine man. He was enormously brave during the anti-apartheid struggle. Desmond and I, are, we were close friends, family friends. He's come to our home for dinner a lot. We went to his daughter's wedding. We were at his consecration as Bishop of Johannesburg. We parted company now because of his attitude on Israel. And I think he's wrong. And I think he's wrong because he's ignorant. And I'll give you one clear example. A few years ago, there was a mixed-race coloured group from Cape Town coming to sing, to perform Borg, Porgy and Bess, the American musical, in Tel Aviv. Tutu called for a boycott, told them not to come. The reason he gave, Palestinians would not be able to attend the performances in Tel Aviv, which showed he had not the slightest idea what he was talking about, because Israeli Arabs or Palestinians, whatever you want to call them, have every right to go where they like. No problem. Palestinians from the West Bank have got to cross a boundary. They're different people. They don't have South Israeli passports. So he was totally, and he didn't understand it. And I pointed this out to him. He didn't talk to me again for a long time. But he was ignorant. He's, if someone is that ignorant about the situation in Israel, how on earth can he go into the world and become such a strong voice, moral voice, as Tutu has been? in talking against Israel. It's something very wrong about it. I think there's more to, to, to Tutu than meets the eye in many ways. But I admire him for what he did in the anti-apartheid struggle. But he's wrong on this one. Now, how does Israel compare with what I've been talking about apartheid? Well, the first basic difference is the Israeli Arabs, who in 1948... Uh, after so many had fled or been chased out at gunpoint. You've got to understand that. It was a very ugly war in a small piece of land. Ugly things were done on both sides. You read the historian Benny Morris and you'll understand that. It was a nasty war. But about 156,000 remained. That's 60, 70 years ago, 156,000. Now, 1.4 million, 1.5 million. So one of the BDS accusations, they talk about genocide. When I show you those two figures, you want to laugh. Genocide. It's madness. They're full citizens of the state. They have the vote. And there already, blacks were denied the vote. The vote means power, however you use it. And Israeli Arabs have got the vote They've got 12 members of Knesset. They form a bloc. They have the vote. That is already fundamentally different. They are full citizens. They have the same rights as me. National insurance, for example. Free hospitalization, exactly the same. We have an Arab who's a member of our Supreme Court. Even more, when a former president, Katsaf, was charged with sex crimes... The magistrate, the three, court, three judges who sat in the initial court, the chairman was an Arab. That's a former Jewish president found guilty. He goes and appeals to the Supreme Court. Five judges hear the appeal. One of them is an Arab. And you talk to me about apartheid? I'll talk to you on a personal basis. I've just been extremely ill for the last year. I'm still a bit shaky on my feet when, I, when you see me climb the platform. I'm struggling a bit. I was extremely ill. I spent a lot of time in Adassa and Kerem Hospital in Jerusalem. My doctors and nurses, and I went through scores of them, were angels. They were Jews, they were Arabs. They were religious, they were non-religious. They all behaved in exactly the same way. Not just to me, but I watched the others, the patients, Israelis, Palestinians. And my doctors tell me they treat people from Gaza. They treat people from the West Bank. They say we do not turn anyone around. 
Sometimes one has to lie in emergency for a day before there's a bed available, but we accept everyone. If I may tell you one little ep personal episode, because it's right imprinted on me, and I'm, I might get emotional about it, because I'm still rather weak. I was waiting to go in for surgery at one stage, and I was lying in the pre-op room, and a Palestinian woman, head covered, very traditional, gets wheeled in in a bed, who's pushing her, an orderly, who's got his head covered, middle-aged man, grey-haired, he's obviously Jewish, and she's as scared as I am. And he's leaning over her, consoling her. And I thought, well, that's beautiful. I look across the room, there was a bed with a little girl, like that, lying in it. Her parents standing next to her, Charedim. Charedim, that's ultra-Orthodox. He's a Hasid wearing a long black coat with gold threads. Real old-fashioned, right out of Poland, 19th century. Who's standing next to her, holding her hand, consoling her? A Muslim nurse with her head covered. And this, this to me is what Israel can be. In the hospitals and clinics, it is. And this is the spirit we need in the country as a whole. But I have seen it. I've seen it and experienced it. And that's one of the beautiful things about Israel, among much else. Well, we've got Arabs head of, at uh, Hadassah Mount Scopus, one of the major hospitals. The chief surgeon, he's an Arab. His name is Dr. Eid. He's not related to Basim, but he's the country's leading transplant surgeon. In the north, one of the major hospitals, the director is an Arab. You've got Arab heads of departments in universities. All through the country, there are Arabs in leading positions. No problems whatsoever. But, and this is where I must em emphasize something as a journalist, Israel, as you know, has accomplished incredible things in less than 70 years. 70 years, in medicine, in agriculture, in the inflow of people, how we've absorbed millions and millions of people, health services, technology, agriculture, water, you name it. We're right up among the top, and that's why we're signing trade deals all the time. China, India, South America, Africa are beating a path to our door to sign deals for technology, agriculture, you name it, they're coming. But it's not a perfect society. The Messiah has not come yet. <laughs> We've got problems. Two in particular where Arabs suffer discrimination, and they're important to know. And I say it because I had to come to terms with this. And for example, I'll give you an example. I came from a repressed society where my whole life, 26 years as a journalist, was spend, spent fighting oppression, exposing investigating, writing, analyzing apartheid, the evils of apartheid. And one of the things was detention without trial. I wrote innumerable editorials in my newspaper. I wrote articles for the Sunday Times in London, the Boston Globe. I broadcast to the BBC and Sky about detention without trial. And I come to Israel and I find we've got four to 600 Palestinians without trial at any one time. And that's very hard for me to understand and to live with. It doesn't lessen my love and my commitment to Israel, but I've got to be aware of these problems. I look at it, is it so different from South Africa? It is in some ways. In South Africa, we had no suicide bombings. The African National Congress, when it turned to violence in 1961, took a decision not to kill white civilians. Firstly, because of its belief in Gandhian nonviolence, and secondly, as a tactic. It realized if it started killing white civilians, whites would never agree to give up. They'd be too frightened. They'd be driven into the sea. So the ANC, apart from a, just a couple of episodes over the years, there were no bombings. And that's why I'm so angry with the Palestinians, because they didn't follow that. And instead, as I said earlier, they drove so many Israelis to, to the right because people are afraid. People are afraid of being killed and massacred, which is what the Arab nations have always threatened anyway. So that's a basic distinction. But I've had to live with some of these things, and the two particular is issues are, uh, way back at the beginning of the 20th century, the Jewish National Fund was created, a little blue box for contributions, um, to buy money for Jews. 
And the idea was to buy land in Palestine, which would be inalienable forever and ever, only for Jews. Now, by the time 1948 came, the JNF had bought about 5.6% of the land. And then with the new government, deals were done and so on, and the JNC added, ended up with 13% of 93%. And to explain that, about 6-7% of the land of Israel is privately owned. The churches own a lot of land. The Knesset, the parliament, is built on land owned by the Greek Orthodox Church. The Knesset leases the land. Okay? Probably got another 40 years to run. Then we'll have to see what happens. Um, but the, the other land, Rothschilds have got a big land holding. The WAF, the Muslim religious uh, organization, owns a lot of land also. So that's about 6-7%. The rest, the 93%, except for a little bit, is state land. You can't buy it. We have an apartment. We own the apartment. We don't own the land. Uh, Britain's got the same system. Leasehold, freehold. This is leasehold. The trouble is that Arabs are not allowed to buy or rent 13% of the 93%. Now, this is where one of the BDS lies come in, because they refer to it. They always talk about Arabs not being allowed to access to 93% of the land. They haven't understood the subtlety of the 13%. It's an anachronism. One day it'll go away. It's something that belongs to history. But at the moment, for all sorts of vested interests, that still remains. And that's an important discrimination. It means Arab villages can't expand. They can't have light industrial areas. They can't raise taxes. So they're poorer. And this has a knock-on effect on education. Because with education, every child in state school, whoever you are, religious, non-religious, Arab, whatever you are, there's a certain amount of money voted at the, end, the beginning of each year to pay for so many hours of teaching. Then you have a wealthy suburb like Kafar Sabah near Tel Aviv, and the parents say, no, no, we need more teachers. We're going to put more money in. We want ballet lessons for our kids. They put money in. Arab schools can't do that. So the gap grows and grows and grows. But Israel is a strange country. Nothing makes sense. You've got to understand that. I've just described to you a situation of inequality developing between Arab and Jew. In fact, not this year, but the year before or years before, the school which regularly did the best in the matric exams each year was an Arab Christian school with mainly Muslim pupils in Nazareth. And the school which was doing worst for many years was a Jewish ultra-Orthodox school in B'nai Barak. A lot of this is related to poverty. Arabs are the worst off, not totally. At the moment, Ethiopian Jews are worse off than the Arabs. And until a couple of years ago, until last year in fact, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, were just above the Ethiopians, below the Arabs. At the moment, they've just gone ahead of the Arabs, and the Arabs are the second worst off, are the worst off, sorry, Ethiopians, Arabs, Haredim, that's the order. But it's not it doesn't follow total racial ethnic lines. There are all sorts of contradictions built into this. And that's an important point to understand about this complex society. It's not straightforward. Um, but this is a problem. Arab villages can't expand. And yet we have the present government, the most right-wing we've ever had, which is now talking about trying to exp allow Arab villages to expand, to have more land. Kids growing up, they want houses. They can't do it at the moment. It's, it's, it, this is a, a very important discrimination. The present government is trying to do something about it. Even the present right-wing government has voted billions of dollars to upgrade the Arab community. Whether they carry it out, we'll have to wait and see. But starting about two years ago, the pledges were made, and we're waiting to see if it's going to be carried into practice. But even this right-wing government is trying to upgrade the Arab community. The second level of discrimination is the army. The army is essential, vital. It, it's kept us alive, and it will keep us alive. For historical reasons, because in 48 there was civil war and it went on, Arabs are not conscripted into the army. Uh, nor are religious Jews, by the way, but Arabs not. And this leads to discrimination. 
When you've done your army service, you get certain perks. You have uh, loans for business, for housing. You get easier admission to university, all things down the line. And the Arab community is denied this. Instead, the government has instituted national service. And you can, you can volunteer to work in a hospital, a community home, whatever like that, and you get the same pay as a non-competent soldier, which is less than a competent. But you get the pay and you get all the perks. It's resisted by the leaders in the Arab community. Basim can explain perhaps better than me why. They, I think they simply fear losing control. That's basically it. They talk about being Judaized. I think that's just an excuse to say we don't lose control of our people. So the num people are enlisting for national service, but a much lower rate than one would hope for at this stage. But those are two important discriminatory F measures which it's, you've got to understand do exist in Israel and something we have to deal with. Now, that's Israel proper. To talk about apartheid in that situation you know, is discrimination. We have racism. We have a couple of hundred rabbis who sign a letter calling on Jews not to rent or sell property to Arabs. You know, they're racists and they're rabbis, which to me makes it worse. But, you know, you have racism in Norway? Okay, <laughs> who doesn't have racism? It's one of the plagues of our time and it's part of human being, humankind working itself out. But apart from that, to apply the apartheid label to Israel in any way is just an absurdity and a total lie. So a lot of the BDS people realize this, that they're on simply ground they can't defend, and they concentrate on the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. Now, it's not the same for one basic reason. In South Africa, we had what were called the Bantustans, which were tribal areas created by the government, trying to restore history, when there used to be tribal tribes in South Africa, African tribes. And the whole purpose of Bantustans was to keep blacks out of white South Africa. It was a reservoir of labor. You were kept there. If you needed a gardener in Johannesburg, you went to the local labor bureau and you said, I want a gardener. And they say, okay, we've got someone locally, otherwise you'll have a permit to get someone from Zululand or wherever it might be. And then they'd reach out to a labor bureau somewhere in Zululand and they'd go to a guy and say, okay, you can go and work in Johannesburg for one year or 18 months, whatever it might be, as a gardener for that person. And if you lose your job, you're out. You've got to get back again. Imagine the exploitation that opened up. People were at the mercy of their white masters, and they would exploit it to the hilt. But the whole purpose of Bantustans was as a reservoir of labor. Ours is different. We don't want Palestinians. Bassam talks about the people, he's right. We have about, at the moment, 70, 80,000 come across every day to work in industry, construction, and so on, with permits. An estimated another 10,000 come in illegally. It's good for the Palestinian economy, as Bassam said. It's, in fact, crucial. But we don't particularly want them. We take them in because we need them. We could replace them with foreign labor, but we're doing it. But the purpose of the Bantustans of the West Bank is entirely the opposite. And the difference stems from the purpose. The whole idea of white South Africa, I use the word intentionality. The purpose of apartheid was oppression. The purpose of apartheid was to exploit blacks as inferior beings. And education and everything else in society was geared to ensuring that blacks remained inferior and were made to know that they were inferior. In our case, there is no such thing. There is no intentionality. The big word in Israel is security. This is where BDS, and this is the important point to understand also, because when they, when they say these things, you must understand the lie that's behind it. They talk about the apartheid wall, I'm trying to use that apartheid world again. Well, the wall is only part of your wall, only a small part. Most of it is a barrier. If you go and see it, it's, um, as it goes on, it's wire fences, trenches, and so on. Why is it there? The original idea was security, to keep out suicide bombers. 
To what extent it succeeded or not is a matter of great discussion because it coincided also with the change in Palestinian attitudes. But that was the purpose. Unfortunately, it got misused. Instead of just being a security barrier, people got in on the act and they started using it to seize Palestinian land. And we took about 6 7% of Palestinian land in the process. And if you go and look at the barrier, you'll see the way it winds and it goes around a Jewish house, a Jewish settlement. It became a political thing. And I'm one of those who is totally against it. But it's not an apartheid wall. That is a total misuse of the word apartheid. It's a security wall. That's the important point. So that's another, that's another of the big, big lies. Big, big lies. Um, now, the other one, and this is where we're very vulnerable, I'm against our presence on the West Bank. I don't, I don't know what would happen to the West Bank if Israel withdraws. I hear what Bassem says, and my attitude as an Israeli is, that's their problem, not mine. People have a right to be free, to live their lives as they want to. If they want to live in a mess, they live in a mess. But I don't want to be in control of them. And as a Jew especially, I don't want to be in control of other people. And I'm embarrassed and ashamed about it. And the trouble is, it began in 1967 with the best of intentions. If you read the history of 67, there were sincere people who started settlements in 67. And then other factors came in extremist relig Jewish religion started appearing then. Greed, nice land, clean air, lower taxes, became opportunistic, and all went sour, and we now are sitting in occupation. The government says it's not occupation. They talk about disputed territory, some legalistic way of doing it. We have an army there suppressing people. That's occupation. No occupation can be pleasant. It's impossible. When you control other people's lives, it cannot be good. And you have terrible tragedies. You have a checkpoint, and a woman approaches. She might have a knife, she might not. There's a young soldier there. He doesn't know if she's got a knife or not. He calls on her to stop. She doesn't hear him, or there's a noise or sound. She keeps walking. He shoots her, understandably. He's scared. Probably could be rightly so. And she's, got, she's carrying nothing. This happens all the time. Our soldiers are ordinary people from the streets of Tel Aviv and Rosh Pina and everywhere else in the country. A lot of them are good youngsters. A lot of them are not. And they behave badly. And every time they do so, I feel bad when I hear about it. Because friends tell me what, you know, what they see. An occupation cannot be pleasant. We shouldn't be there. The trouble with it, as far as BDS is concerned, horrible things happen. BDS don't just report the horrible things. They take something that is basically true, and they distort it, and they twist it. And then I, you know, I'll read about an episode, and then I'll read the BDS version or Electronic Intifada. I can't believe it's the same episode. They've turned it around and twisted it. In other words, we're providing the ammunition for them, which they're misusing. But it's our deeds that create the basis for a lot of what they say. And I disagree totally with what they say. The, other, the third big lie is the call for sanctions. And they say sanctions brought down apartheid. That's a total lie. Just not true. Sanctions were a contribution to the end of apartheid. It's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, just this last few days, I've been reading a new book came out of South Africa in April which examines the sanctions that went on against South Africa. It's called Arms, Arms Money and by Man van Feeren. And I agree, he, he says exactly what I've known for years. Israel is accused of having traded with apartheid South Africa, which we did. Every other country in the world traded with apartheid South Africa. I don't know of a single country Arab, European, African, South American, they did not trade with apartheid South Africa because there was money involved. A lot of sanctimonious stuff was said. Norway traded until 1973 legally 
when a law was enacted domestically to prohibit it, I'd be surprised if illegal trade didn't continue after 1973, because everyone was doing it. There were sanctions all over the world. Everyone was trading because there was a lot of money. South Africa was under an oil boycott by the United Nations. I know of one period of a week, because I was, as an editor, I was briefed by the government on what was going on when we were short of oil in all the years. Otherwise, we had as much oil as we wanted. We paid about 20% more than the market rate. The oil came from Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, you name it. Everyone. There was money involved. Ships would set off on the high seas. The direction would change, and they'd go to South African harbor. Everyone made millions out of it, but there was trade. And that's the other lie, that to accuse Israel of being the, the only sinner is nonsense. It's just a total lie. And I can give you more information. I've got a quote from this guy where he says, uh, he describes what actually happened. He, in fact, yeah, I must read this little bit to you. This is what this man von Fieren. We need to separate reality from fiction. Isolation, that's boycotts, was the fiction, which repeated for political ends. In reality, the apartheid state walked through open doors around the world and a direct diplomatic and economic links be closed, behind closed doors. It bought, sold, and bartered with the heads of corporations, governments, and intelligence agencies. An army of crafty middlemen made a mint of money out of helping to cut such deals. This is a reflection not of how the anti-apartheid movement was defeated, but of how the conservative political groupings and the financial interests collude to undermine the work of Democrats. So that's the next big lie. Sanctions were not successful. Sanctions will not work against Israel. They're, 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 they're a nuisance value. They are not stopping us. As I was saying earlier, we're doing trade deals all over the place. We're booming. Africa has just opened up to us. The Prime Minister Netanyahu has made a succession of trips he was in East Africa last year, last week. Africans are clamoring to get on board with us. So that's another lie. And then um, uh, I quoted from Viren to you. Now, also in BDS propaganda, lies abound, just full of it. And there's some mad things. I mean, I record, I was telling you a story about that. When I was writing this book of mine, I had a scholarship at the University of Cape Town, a fellowship. And I started on the chapter to describe some of the critics of Israel. And I spent all day trying to write until late that night. And I couldn't get the right tone, the opening sentence. And I finally decided, oh, I'll get up in the morning and try again. And as I was getting into bed, I actually had my foot on the bed. I suddenly stopped and I had, I had an epiphany. I said, You've been trying to be a nice, good, liberal all day and trying to be fair to these people. Instead, you want to kick them in the balls. That's all. And I felt very happy, and I went, started the next morning, and I got it exactly. Because the amount of lies that are told, I mean, some of the things are quite extraordinary. Um, there's, if, I'll just give you two examples. In, in England, there's a woman, Jacqueline Rose, a British academic who happens to be Jewish, and doesn't want Israel to exist. So she's written, quote, we believe Zionism to be a form of, of collective insanity. She goes even further. She raises a possibility that Adolf Hitler and Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zionism, both attended the same performance of Wagner in Paris, and this inspired the separate writing of Hitler's Mein Kampf and Herzl's seminal book, The Judenrat, The Judenstadt. There's not the slightest evidence that Hitler or, or, or Herzl ever met. The times just don't work out together. Yet she writes, this is a respected academic who writes this nonsense. Norway. You've got a particular bit of craziness in this country. I don't know if you know it. It's in my book. I came across it. There's, in, in a report about a May 2008 visit to Israel, by two Socialist Youth League members from Norway, Thea Schelt, Chet, and Nora Ibrahim. And they reported in writing 
We have heard stories of Palestinians who are checkpointing and waiting to get through when two female Israeli checkpoint guards line up in front of them and have sex. Can you believe it? People writing this sort of thing? I mean, it's just, it's beyond comprehension. That's your contribution to world knowledge. Luckily, they're more sensible people than that in Norway. But that was actually, that's actually on record. Now, the most far-reaching deception in BDS concerns the right of return. The three BDS aims are return to 67 boundaries, equality for the Arab citizens, which I'm saying is, is a rubbish because they have got equality. The third one is right of return. And this is deceptive. It sounds good. It appeals to people's humanity. People lost their homes in 1948, 750,000 or so. They should have a right to go home. It's a hidden bomb. As I explained earlier, the definition of Palestinian refugees is unique. The original refugees and their descendants forevermore. Now, six to eight million estimated people. For them to have the right of return would mean the end of Israel. That is the purpose of BDS. That's why they talk about right of return and a lot of gullible people in the world fall for it. We feel sorry for Palestinians. They should have the right of return. They don't understand. This is cynical, manipulative, totally dishonest. Because there won't be a right of return. It won't happen. Because it would mean the end of Israel. At the most over the years, we've talked about family reunion. Perhaps 60,000. Perhaps 100,000. Probably not today, because feelings have changed. But perhaps some would be allowed to return. But otherwise, the idea of right to return is um, the fundamental BDS lie. Thank you.